praise the Lord, we're moving forward with Vidivo Bible. <laughs> the reason I say that is because we've been struggling with trying to get all of these things organized. I mean, on the one hand, the wind's blowing outside. We have some windstorm warnings that uh, are going on in the state of Utah that uh, when you live on the banks of or the foothills of the Wasatch Mountain Range, you wind up with sometimes the wind coming from the south and it blows upward, kind of this effect that brings in some unusual weather patterns. Sometimes you have it come from the north, which brings in some of the, as any other northern wind does, you know, some interesting weather patterns. Usually snow for Utah and maybe some rain and things like that. When it comes from the Great Salt Lake, which is on the west of me, sometimes you get some snow lake snow effects in the winter, and in the summer you get kind of like, you could smell the Great Salt Lake. <laughs> Matter of fact, what happens when you get winds over by the Great Salt Lake and off of and around there, you get whiteouts from the salt or the dirt and the sand, so it gets really interesting from that direction. But what's really interesting is when it comes out of the east, an east wind. Because when it comes from the east, you get kind of what they call this downwind or downslope wind effect that, like a sheer wind effect, causes like venturis from the little valleys for the weather to, or the wind to increase in, in force or in effect. As a matter of fact, Right here where I live in Bountiful, right on the border of Woods Cross, as a matter of fact, I could probably stick my hand out and it would be Woods Cross, and I stick my hand out on the other side and it's Bountiful. Kind of one of those things, it's in between and right on the boundaries. But when I see the wind blowing like a bat out of hell, literally from the east, I go down the street maybe less than a mile and it's a still, calm, no wind effect. And then you go farther and you come into Salt Lake City and it's even windier sometimes, sometimes not. But it's interesting that it can have that disparity or that difference or divergence of application or realization of what's going on in the wind and of the wind and by the wind in these areas that I live in. And so in Utah we have that kind of effect that you could see part way down the highway, you know, different wind occurrences or up in the gorge or higher up in the elevations, like 7,000 feet up, as opposed to where I live, which is about 4,000 feet. So it's very interesting to me in those ways that God uses the wind and the way the wind is described sometimes as far as what Jesus was saying, that we don't know where it's coming from nor where it's going, so too is everyone led by the Spirit of God. And I like that because oftentimes people tell me they understand the wind, they know about the wind, they use the wind, and they do the wind. But I got news for you. I don't know if you've ever realized or you've ever recognized just how much the wind can cause things to happen or that God uses your life much like the wind that the wind bloweth whither it will, you neither know where it's coming from nor where it's going. So too is everyone led by the Spirit of God. My life has been like that. Well, I don't know which way it's going. I don't know what God is doing, but sometimes God is taking it in a variety of directions. If you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm looking up Zephaniah because it's kind of like, oh, come on, I know it's right here in the minor prophets, kind of the major prophets, Ezekiel, Daniel. I know I'm supposed to do Zephaniah, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Haggai. But I'm also in the wrong place. I'm going, okay, it's not there, but it's got to be over here. And then I go over here, and then it's not there, and you go, well, fine. Sometimes you just feel like you don't know where it is, so you should look at the table of contents or have one of those cheater tabs. But you see, I don't use a lot of times those book tabs or the chapter tabs or even the books, because oftentimes whenever I'm reading something or I'm studying it, I'm already there. So when I pull up, a, usually I got Bibles strung out everywhere, but when I pull up a new Bible, and I go, that's funny, I thought it was right here. And then I'm like, well, I can't find it. You know, so I don't memorize the books of the Bible. So I'm like you. It's kind of like I go along, and then one minute I'm like instantly flip it open right to where it's at. And then another minute it's like God wants to humble me. So I go, okay, fine. I can't find it, Lord. Where is it? Why can't you organize these things? Keep them all in alphabetical order. Well, sure enough, because it's so small, 
it was right where I thought it was, but unfortunately the pages were <laughs> kind of fresh and crisp, though I didn't really turn to it. But it was Zephaniah, Zechariah, if I remember right, Haggai, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi, Haggai, Haggai, Zechariah, well anyways, you get the picture. So, we've been studying in the book of Zephaniah, and we did part one last time we were assembled together, and today in Vidivo Bible, we want to get to part two. And I'm excited about that because it's like, ooh, we're going to complete a book. Wow, what a novel idea. I mean, I got so many parts of books of Bible all over the place on the internet that, boy, be nice to finish the book. And we'll see because who knows, God may stop us in the middle thereof. Because last time we went from chapter 1 into chapter 2 and we stopped at, Seek ye the Lord, all you meek of the earth, that which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Because we were talking about prophecy, and we were talking about probability, and we were talking about application of what God was saying. And it kind of blew my mind when I was reading it. I don't think I read it in this Bible because it was kind of like it was up on the right-hand corner of the page. It was kind of like interesting where we stopped. But, you know, this is okay. It's another Bible that I have laying around. You know, it happens to be, I use a lot of open Bibles. I like their format, but, you know, it doesn't matter what Bible you have. Whatsoever the Bible that you have in your hands is the best one that you should use. And talking about the wind, you know, it's oftentimes amazing to me how this wind can blow cold or blow hot or blow north or blow south or blow east or blow west. And that's kind of what God does with the Word of God. He may use it in your life in such a way that he wants to demonstrate something that you may not have seen yesterday that you'll see today that may have application tomorrow or yet in another way he may make it personal to you so that he's speaking to you as we do pray in Video Bible that the Word of God by the Spirit of God to the people of God, you and I, to the people of God, of the Son of God, Jesus. In other words, everything that you see in a book, the Bible, the book of books, is just a written word. It's not perfect. It's not ineffable or inaccurate or accurate. It's not perfectly written. It has errors in it. But as the Spirit of God causes you to understand it, as the Spirit of God causes it to apply to your life, as the Spirit of God gives you not only a heart to receive it, but an ears to hear God speaking it, and an ability to see how it applies to your life, as well as to know the wisdom that God has for you, then today you find that it is perfect for you today. Now, it may not be perfect for you tomorrow, unless you ask God to apply it by His Spirit as he does because we're led by the Spirit of God. Not because you can sit down and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to plan out this organized, you know, religion inductive Bible study and I'm going to have it all set and ready to go for, you know, when? Well, if God knows you're going to do that, then he'll make it applicable to that day. You know, and you'll study it and get your message for it all together in the way that he wants it to be presented for that day. Me personally, I've lived my life consistently, persistently, all the days of my life, based upon a pretty interesting scripture that, you know, some of these well-trained, well-brained, you know, and often real, very well-schooled and formatted Christians are going to go, eh, not evil, but hey, when Jesus said to me, you know, that you don't have any need that, you know, prepare yourself or to, you know, think about what you're going to say ahead of time, but the Spirit of God, when they bring it up before magistrates, before, you know, the lawyers and before the doctors and all these other guys, you know, I'll give you what to say at the time. And the interesting thing was, in living out that particular word from the Lord that he gave me, now maybe it doesn't work for you, but for me, I was brought before the chief rabbinate in Israel. I mean, under a halakhic law, my ex-wife was wanting to divorce me from her newfound faith of wanting to go into Orthodox Judaism while hiding, she said, her faith in Jesus, but wanting to be a covert, undercover Jew, supposedly, and eventually make Aliyah, but at the time wanted me to divorce her on the grounds of Jewish law, and I didn't want to, you know, because I personally, you know, said, hey, you know, that's not a good reason to get divorced, you know what I mean? Frankly, so you could go witness? I mean, sounds a little weird there. So, 
frankly, you know, I had to go through this long examination by the rabbinate. You know, the rabbinate in Israel is one of those types of environments that you would call the Sanhedrin. You know, the council of rabbis, the, the ruling body of religious law in Israel. And they brought me up, you know, and they said, hey, you know, you know we could keep you here forever. You know, and they, they had put a $50,000 bond on me, preventing me from leaving Israel. Most people can't stay in Israel, and I, I was forced to stay because they wanted to force me into giving a get to my wife. To say, get, gone, go, good, you know, and that's the way Jewish law works. Get, 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 you know, and you get a literal performance of a ceremony where they take your marriage contract and they burn it and they take the ashes and they smear it on the person and they really humiliate the woman when it comes to a get but she gets gone you know and you get free and quite frankly the orthodox have a lot of ways of doing these things that are just yeah. no wonder jesus said yeah you know don't do it you know and i was wrestling with a lot of issues at the time being that i had been there to help calvary chapel jerusalem which is no longer there um, and some of the messianic groups that were behind the scenes doing things and I was one of those ones that was doing things behind the scenes and Fortunately the chief rabbinate never put me in a position to say well What's your faith or you know who do you believe in but he was trying to put me in a box you know and to make me do something I didn't want to do you know and so you know he would constantly put me in a spot and I said you know well Ask her because I wanted to put her you know the onus back on her to say well whether she was a Christian or not so they would say well you know, according to our law, you have to give up this and that and the other thing. I said, no, according to the law, I have to make a covenant. And if I make a covenant and an agreement, then I have to live up to that covenant and an agreement. I said, so you want me to break that covenant? Oh, no, 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 We don't want you to do it. We want you to come to the conclusion that you should do it. Wait a minute. You don't want me to do it, but you want me to come to the conclusion to do it, so you're telling me that you want me to do it. No, 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 you don't understand. Let me tell you what I mean. You should want to make your wife happy by giving what makes her happy, so for her to be happy, you should let her go so she can go be happy. Right, but I made a covenant before God. Well, no, 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 don't look at it that way. And so they went on and on and on, and I had to keep coming back, and they kept coming back to these things. And God kept giving me these words to say that, Finally, in the end, I got thrown out of the, the interrogation, so to speak, because the chief rabbi looked at me and he says, you know, I can tell you to do it and you have to do it because I'm the chief rabbi. And I said, so when I make a contract with God, are you going to tell me to keep that contract with God? Or are you going to tell me to break that contract with God? And boom, the, the, the interpreter for the chief rabbi, you know, about lost it. He was like... Pfft. You know, and he started cracking up, and I was like, everybody got mad, but the w one guy knew what I was saying, and he laughed, you know, and it kind of got kind of like a storyline, you know, later on, and I was like, finally, phew, you know, they threw me out of there, because, you know, they didn't have an answer. You know, because the rabbi's not going to be there when I stand before God. I said, what are you going to do? You're going to stand there before God and tell him why I was divorced? Or are you going to stand there before God and tell him why I'm married? I said, you know, I'm the one that's got to stand before God. i got to give an accounting. Because there's a lot of Judaism that really is very... Why we call it Judeo-Christianity is because it is Judeo from Judaism. Jewish. Hey, what can I say? So anyways, long story short, she wound up getting her divorce eventually. But it was a very interesting time that God gave me the words to say. And it made a witness and a testimony to those that were there that day. And later on, it was a witness to the Messianic Jews and some of the Jews that I knew and some of the Christians and everything else. Because everybody was pulling and tugging at me to do something they wanted me to do. And I just kept doing what the Lord told me to do. So it's interesting in that. So we come to Zephaniah, who is literally the Lord has hidden, is what his name means, or that God is our refuge or our strong tower. Zephaniah technically means that God has hidden him or God has protected him or God is his defense. And I like that because there's a lot of different ways in Jewish culture, sometimes when you have a word to interpret it, you know, a certain way, you know, like, like, um, I, well, I can't think of a word right now, but the point being is that there's a variety of expressions that apply to particular words, like Zephaniah. And in that, you know, I see right here, because I'm looking at this little, you know, intro thingy, it says, you know, means the Lord hides or the Lord has hidden. His name indicates confidence in the power of God to hide his worshiper in time of danger. What it really means is just simply that God is our strength. God is our refuge. God is our protection. God is our defense. 
In other words, Zephaniah is a lot like what I was in the rabbi's case. And Zephaniah is a lot like what you and I are today. Because you see, there are Christians that say you got to go out and get a gun. No. You got to go out and get a security system. No. You got to go out and, you know, like, hey, we got to protect ourselves from other terrorists that are over there. ISIS is going to get you. The devil going to get you, and he's going to take you, and he's going to make you, and he's going to break you. No. Zephaniah. I mean, that's what you should be telling somebody. Zephaniah. 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 You know, because really, if God isn't your defense, if God isn't your protection, where does your help come from? Well, that's what our study is about. I don't know about you, but my help cometh from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So we're picking up in Zephaniah chapter 2, literally in verse 3. And we'll start there, even though we ended there on verse 3. We'll start in verse 3 this time. Seek ye the Lord, all you meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the days of the Lord's anger. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron will be rooted up. Woe unto the inhabitants of the sea coast and the nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, or Canaan, the land of the Philistines, Palestine. <laughs> Forget you guys, man. You don't even understand that one. I will even destroy you. There there shall be no inhabitant. And the sea coast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and folds for flocks. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. And they shall feed thereupon in the house of Ashkelon. Shall they lie down in the evening? For the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon, or Ammon whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall spoil them and the remnant of my people shall possess them. Now I got news for you. About the time of 2-3 all the way through 2-9, we're talking about Israel right now in this space and time. We're talking about Gaza. Whenever people tell me, what are you going to do about Gaza? I say, well, do you think God hasn't covered Gaza in the Bible? Do you think that we really have to do something about Gaza? I think Gaza is, and the Gaza wars seem to be just exactly like God said they would be. You see, in Zephaniah, he isn't talking about then only. He's talking about now because he says the remnants of my people, the remnants of the Jews who come back into the land, I would what? Visit them and turn away their captivity. One of the captivities that Israel suffered was the fact that the Roman culture cast them out into dispersion. They were captive by their own sins and rejecting Jesus, but that captivity was a dispersion. It was a curse because of what they had done. God was going to bring them once again, all 12 tribes, Dare I say, they're not lost. Somehow Jewish culture has always known where they are because we keep track of that. But for some reason, Christians think there's lost tribes. And then they try to make up somebody that's a lost tribe. First England tried it by saying they were the lost tribe. So you had Anglo-Israelism. Then the Mormons tried it until they realized that, oops, genetic research came along. And before they could really push it too hard, they had to deny it that, oh, okay, we're not the other Jewish tribe. Or are we, or are they, as they keep trying to say, they're one of the lost peoples that came over. Okay. <laughs> That's why they have that big museum in Jerusalem by, you know, the Mormon Center. You know, that's there in, and I went by there, you know, I used to talk to some of the Mormon missionaries back when they were still thinking they were Jewish. I used to say, you know, I get what you're saying, but, you know, I'm sorry, but... No, no Jew is going to accept you as Jewish. <laughs> You're Mormon. <laughs> That's the way it is. Sorry. But here we're talking about verses 3 through 9, and we're really talking about Ashkelon. We're talking about by the sea. We're talking about house of Judah. We're talking about Gaza. We're talking about the Ammonites. We're talking about the Philistines, Palestines. I mean, there's people out there that, for some reason, Christians go 
and disengaged brains when they listen to somebody talk about Israel because they think Israel can do no wrong and yet Israel bombed the snot out of one of our destroyers back in the the war with the you know, early war you know liberation and you know kind of like sank a battleship you know but got away with it oh well sorry about that you know. <laughs> oops and you don't realize that there are things that Israel does that are good that God will command. There are things that Israel does that are wrong that God may use a nation to bust them with. There was a time where some Israeli soldiers were harvesting organs. They got busted by the United Nations. They kept denying and denying it. And then a hush hush report admitted that there were a few guys that did it and they busted them. You see, it's not about us versus them. It's about what God is saying back in verse 3. Seek ye the Lord you meek of the earth you know be humble about you know if you say okay you know i pray for the peace of jerusalem but i don't support israel 100 percent you know i mean come on now israel's done some things that are evil and wrong matter of fact bb mr netanyahu in his new election snuck over to america and tried to use it as a political maneuver in order to get votes back in israel and everybody knew it everybody talked about it in israeli papers americans went oh Oh no, Mr. President, you're wrong. He's innocent. He's just doing what he needs to do in order to protect Israel. After all, God's protection isn't in Zephaniah. God's protection for Israel is in the strength of Bibi, king of Israel. Melaka Melchim, Melaka Israel, Bibi Netanyahu. Whoa, you better be careful who you're calling king of Israel. And that's what they call Bibi, king of Israel. Dangerous place to be in prophecy. But knowing that Israel, like America, does things good and does things bad, that means, you know, you can say what's wrong and you can say what's right, but you still pray that God would use his light to bring to light those things that are true and accurate. Even as it continues on in verse 3 and says, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness. In other words, if Israel's wrong in a war, tell them they're wrong in a war. If they're going about destroying people that don't need to be destroyed too many more times, hey, you know, or if they have a housing problem that they're not taking care of their own people, tell them that. You know, I mean, it's frankly, I lived in Israel and there's a serious problem in Israel. Some serious social issues. <coughs> don't tell me it's a democracy. Melech Israel, the king of Israel, Bibi, said he wants to make a Jewish Jew nation. Whoa, wrong. God said, let the strangers in their midst be in Israel. They should have rights. They should do, don't do as the strangers do, but they were welcome. As you were strangers in Misraim, if you were strangers in Egypt, so too a forever a perpetual per perpetuity law will be in existence that you welcome the stranger in your midst, not cast him out of Israel like Bibi wants to say, hey, we want a Jewish nation for ourselves. Jewish citizenship is for Jews, not for the rest of yous. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court in Israel isn't going to go along with that, but hey, if they change the charter, which is what he's proposing, then it would. And that's why there's been a special election. Because somebody's becoming a Jewish supremacist, so to speak. Don't go too far with it, but it's technically true. So, therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab, and it goes on and on, and talks about what the judgment will be, and wipes him out. This shall they have for their pride, because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. Now that's an interesting thing in verse 10, because he says, it's for their pride I'm doing this. That sounds familiar, and I don't mean the president's pride, because a lot of people say, well, yeah, we're going to use that against the president. No, I'm talking about Christian. I'm talking about, are you, in your pride, depending upon your own strength, or have you turned your life over to Jesus and are living like Jesus said, not like what you've been bred to believe in America? You see, in America, there's this exceptionalism being taught that, hey, we're the exception to the rule. You know, we're the Christian, the new revelation of Christianity. We are the strong. We are the might. We have God in our sight. So we're right and you're wrong. So we can go out and take our gun and shoot you. We can go out and do what we want to do in the nations. We can send our drones. We can bomb the hell out of innocent people and kill the one we're after, even though there's some, some collateral damage. Oops, sorry about that. We'll pay you. 
are you sure you get the same Bible I got? Because that's not what Jesus said. That's not what Christianity taught, and that's not what we're about. The gospel isn't about, well, you know, when, you, when we bomb the snot out of you, beat up your country seven or eight times, as we've done in the Middle East, changing dictators and swapping them in and out according to what we want. You know, then we'll go ahead and give you the gospel. By the way, you know, we slip in a little Christianity on the side, too. Oh, yeah. Along with our democracy and our free enterprise system, which is evil. But reality is, in some ways, what they call the beast is what we are. We're technically, in some ways, spiritual Babylon. Commercialism is evil. Did you hear that? I want to make it clear. Commercialism is evil because its stock and trade is humanity and it sells and buys people like cheap commodities. I want to replay that and write that down because that's a good quote. Quote me on that, please, and then put me out on a poster somewhere saying that. The Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship him, everyone from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. Oh, we finally found America. The isles of the heathen. That is America. So, you know, if you want to stretch a point, if you want to get real for a moment, I always teach everyone, if you say America is a prophecy, you're false. And it's true, it's, America is not a prophecy. But the closest it comes, the vagueness of its own reality, God doesn't ignore the fact that America as a country is technically included in prophecy, but where it's included is not a place you want to be. It's included in the isles of the Gentiles, not the seas of Tarshish <coughs> or the shipping lanes or all those other things that they try to make America fit, and then they try to make it a rosy picture. Are these, go are these glasses colored rose? I don't think so. I think they see clearly. But there in verse 11, it says, The Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will famish, he will reduce... He will bring down, because he was talking about pride earlier, bring down the gods of the earth. And men shall worship him, everyone from his place, even all the isles of the Gentiles. How could you worship from your place? Now, I'm sitting in my place, and you're in your place, and you're watching this, so guess what? You're in your place. That's what he's talking about. Literally, you'll be able to see this and be reduced by it because of economic reasons and because of physical location and because technological advances, and because of spiritual realities, and because you could stay in the Isle of the Gentiles, and still God does work according to his measure of condemning and calling into question what you're doing, O Isle of Gentiles. So in the Isle of Gentiles, or the Isles of the Heathen, I'm not a heathen, I'm a Christian. Well, do you kill like a heathen? Do you murder like a heathen? Do you act like a heathen? Do you justify your actions like a heathen? Do you do wars and rumors of wars and act like all the other heathen nations. Then the gods of the world is your God and the gods of the nations is your God because the God of peace has come unto you and he has said, love your enemies. Do good to those that despitefully use you. Now, I, you know, I just want to stick with, you know, the gods of, you know, the gods of the earth. The gods of the earth kill. You know, the gods of the earth are the, the Greek gods. And we have them, you know, in America today. You can look around, you can say, well, what god was it that, you know, is the god of football? Janus, of course. Don't you see that, you know, in the Olympics? Don't you see that in football, baseball? You get this accolades, you get your trophy, you get your ring. Dare I say, you know, your gods have been very much assimilated into American culture? Welcome to the Isles of the Heathens. The heathens worship that. How many football stats, baseball stats, and fantasy leagues are you in? Hey, let's be real. I'm not trying to be a legalist, but I'm telling you a realist, you know, what it is. And that's a fact, Jack. People do worship their God through television. You know, God can't do nothing, but they worship and bow down to it, spending hours, spending money, spending time, spending energy. You want to know how a God is defined? Just was, right there. Time, energy, money. You're sacrificing to your idol. And it's making you idle. So if you find out that the idols are what makes you idle, then quit being idle and go about the Lord's business, not being about the business of the gods of the heathen, or being in the aisles of the heathen and following the gods of the earth, because that's what they are. The sports 
literally have gods of the earth. Or even better, the music industry, we won't even go there. You already know that that's wrong and that's false and that's heathen. You know that. You've been taught that. You know better. Or just look at the black culture with rapping, japping, you know, tapping, stap. You know, I mean, that's what literally, you know, you got all these guys doing this thing, you know, because they're making bucks and then they, what do they do with their money? They take it inside, you know, some strip joint and they fan their money out. Oh, hey, let's go ahead and worship our God. Just like they did in temple days. When the gods of the heathens were being celebrated, throw money, yeah, worship. Just like the Greek gods, just like the Roman gods, just like the Norse gods. Now, the Norse gods, we could get back into the wars, you know, and the battles, and, you know, like some of the Roman gods and some of the Greek gods. But there are other gods of celebration, you know, for engorging yourself. What do they say about America today? We are overweight. Hey, guess what god that is? Doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. Party hardy. So, God speaks and addresses the isles of the Gentiles because he's warning us in Zephaniah about what's coming. And so we get into you Ethiopians in verse 12. Also, you shall be slain by my sword. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that's been happening for a long time now and still happening. So how could you not know that Ethiopia is Ethiopia when it's held by the nations of the countries of today called Ethiopia and back then it was called Ethiopia? Hello? If God wanted to say America, he would have said America. Instead, he says what it is. The isles of the heathen. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and will make Nineveh desolation and dry like a wilderness. I mean, you don't got to go far to figure out where those are today and see exactly what they are doing right now. Wiped out, partly by America, mainly by America. Still fighting wars. Well, we can't leave there because guess what? We created a vacuum and now ISIS has come and now we got rid of ISIS so we're going to put someone else there. We got rid of Al-Qaeda so we're going to change the name Al-Qaeda to ISIS so that way anybody that wants to be a terrorist can just call themselves ISIS and we'll promote it on the news because anybody anywhere at any time all they got to do is say ISIS and then bingo you get all the stamp seal of approval from the news industry. Doesn't matter whether you really are part of ISIS, doesn't matter whether you really are a segment of it. You know, oh well, you know, it's terrorism so it's the war, you know. <laughs> well, Never mind the details, uh, you know, it's not like prophetic, where you got to be exact. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. We still have Assyria. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what that is. And Nineveh. And the flock shall lie down in the midst of her, all the beasts of the nations. Both the cormorant and the bittern will lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds. For he shall uncover the cedar work, or in this case, destroy all that which was wrought by man. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How is she become a desolation and a place for beasts to lie down in? Everyone that passes by her shall hiss and wag his hand. Dare I say, while we see that applied to Assyria, and we see that about the rejoicing city Nineveh, and we can see that later about Babylon, and we see that about a lot of things, can I tell you something? Being that it's in the context of the chapter where the Isle of the Gentiles or the Isle of the Heathens is, and America is included in this, I would say to you that if you could receive this by the Spirit of God, if you want to make it applicable to the Word of God, speaking to you by His own Spirit about what Jesus wants to warn us about, about being what? There is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly. Ooh. Ow. Oh. Be careful. What is named by one name may apply to another as we read it, and God gives witness to what that city is doing. If it fits the shoe, and the shoe fits, and they're doing the same as that city did, then likewise they shall be challenged by it. And so too, as Nineveh was, saying in her heart, I am, isn't that what an American says? My rights. My rights. Not God shed his grace on thee, but my rights. Not God's will be done. My will be done. I am, after all, the superpower. I am the... And you can add whatever you want. Isn't that really America? The Isle of the Heathen? Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. 
She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. What do you think? Really, you're listening. What do you think? You're studying Zephaniah. Are you, it's like, well, that's good for them, but that doesn't apply to me. That's for them. That's not us. You know, we're U.S. Us is United States. Well, yeah, we're really united. That's not us. You know, we're Christians. We're safe and sane and, you know, we're okay. We're the ones that, you know, are like doing the right thing. Not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. If the church is giving forth the birth to the bride, is the bride then getting nearer to God or farther away? The question I would have for you today is that, are you trusting in the Lord or are you trusting in your arms and strength of character? We're going to stop right here now. Funny, I didn't think it'd go three. But that's where we have to be when we examine ourselves to find if we be in the faith. You see, Zephaniah is all about his name and his name is all about trusting in the Lord and making God our strength. God our refuge, God our protection. And yet you'll find Christians saying, I got to go out and buy another gun and more guns. And more people are dying th that were innocent because suddenly a guy flips out and says, hey, you know what? I lost my job. I lost my car. I lost my money. Now I'm going to shoot my wife. Why is the wife being shot? Because he's possessed. You see, the demon possession or demonic possession means there has to be a vacuum before there's an infusion of something because there can be no existence of emptiness that something doesn't fill in. Even the very nature of casting out demons that Jesus said that the demon, once he's been cast out of a person, goes outside of into outer darkness and goes around the world seeking other demons that are worse than him and he comes back to that house that he was cast out of and he sees that it's all been cleaned and it's all been straightened up and it's all been dispossessed of evil and then he comes in and wrecks havoc and the second state is worse than that of the first state of the man. Because you see, the man got his house clean, but he didn't stay near the Lord. He didn't possess his possession being dispossessed of Satan. He didn't put the Holy Spirit inside. He caused that little bit of faith to, to become no faith at all. What little measure of faith you've been given will be taken away, Jesus said, unless you do what he says. So the reality of just seeking the Lord, as we said in chapter 2, verse 3, may be true. You should seek the Lord. And in verse chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Seek ye the Lord, all you meek of the earth, which have brought his judgment. But then he goes on and he explains seeking the Lord. Seek his righteousness, or seek righteousness. Seek meekness, not weakness, not strength, but meekness. Humbly submitting yourself unto the Lord. It may be that you'll be hid in the day of the Lord's wrath. You, maybe you'll be spared the great tribulation. Doubtful, but you'll probably go into it. But, hey, you might be. And then he goes on into verse 15, or verse chapter 3, verse 2. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord, and she drew not near to God. Where is the voice of the Lord in your life? What is God speaking to you? In other words, I'm not telling you to go read something and then say, that's the voice of the Lord. I'm telling you, you better know the voice of the Lord because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. They will not follow the voice of another. In other words, you're not supposed to be sitting under some pastor and going, Amen, brother. Uh, I'd rather say, that's the Lord. I heard God speak to me in that word that I heard. Because that's what God does. If God is speaking to you, you know that. Now, he might speak through people. Pastors, teachers, elders, deacons, whoever, donkeys, whatever, heathen even. He's used every kind of imaginable tool you could think of throughout the entire scripture, so he got everything covered. I can't think of anything he couldn't speak through, you know, in some way. But really, God wants you today as the admonition, as the warning, as the word of God says, and as God himself is saying, today if you hear his voice, Harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation, because it's today you should hear his voice. It's today that his voice is speaking out to you. It is from the word, but it's by the word as the spirit of God is speaking to you and causing you to have ears to hear what the spirit of God is saying. Not the word that's written in paper 
and the blank stare you might get when you read it there because you might not have God showing you or revealing to you something that you don't know does apply to you. Because the first warning and admonition is that with which God has said in verse 2, she obeyed not the voice. We have the program called The Voice, and it's not about that, baby. I tell you, on television, they got more input into your life than God does in your life. Because guess what? God speaks. Why can't you hear? God is speaking. Are you deaf? God has spoken, and he doesn't quit talking. Jesus said that literally by his brother in James 1.5, if any man lacked wisdom, you could ask of God. If God could be asked of, then you should expect that God could be spoken of and that God could speak to you. Why aren't you listening? Why aren't you hearing? That's the admonition of Zephaniah. You don't put your trust in someone else because they could be wrong. They, for themselves, may apply that word to themselves as the Spirit of God gives for themselves that application of the word. But, in reality, you can't blame someone else when you don't know the name of who it is that was speaking to you in the first place. If God is speaking to you, you know the voice of your master. But then it goes on, and it says, not just obeyed not the voice, she received not correction. You see, God knows you know. God didn't buy the excuse you gave to me or your friends or your neighbors or your church or your pastor or, you know, some guy on the internet or Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever you're in to or the fact that you've been so busy with all these other things on television that you have no time for, you know, God's vision, but hey, that's okay, you know, because after all, I got grace, you know, I'm saved. But she didn't receive correction. So, he's not saying you don't hear. He's saying you did hear. He's saying you do know, but you don't receive correction. And that's one of the things that we have to recognize. God doesn't just want us to hear his word so that we Hey, I can say, I'm spiritual, man. I can hear God speak. God speaks to me. He wants us to obey, because to obey is better than sacrifice. And the reality of what Jesus said was that my Father is speaking to me, and I'm speaking to my Father, and then we have it recorded that he spoke to each other. Ah! I'm hearing voices. Yes, you are. You better be, or you're going to hell. Because really, this is what Zephaniah is trying to warn us about. You didn't hear the voice. You didn't receive correction. And worse, you didn't trust in the Lord. I mean, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, what more do you want? Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. But in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. That means God will direct you. God will speak to you. You have to hear his voice. You have to receive correction. You have to do his will. It's not just, baby, I believe and I'm going to receive, so I got out of here and I'm going to live like I'm going to live like I want to live. That's not the way it works. He's speaking. Now, he may bless you because he's speaking. He may say, hey, I just got news for you. <laughs> I just sent you a check, you know, and all you got to do is go open up the mail. Well, you didn't receive correction. You didn't know it was in the mail, nor do you go after it and get it because you didn't listen. You have to listen. You have to do. You have to receive. You have to be true. And so finally he says, probably the worst injunction that any Christian could hear. Probably the worst word that I ever want to deliver, especially from a prophet of God, from someone who's telling me personally to live according to no guns, no protection, no resources at all except for a big God. Except for God. But he says, she drew not near to her God. You didn't draw near to God. Because God says, if you would draw near to me, I will draw near to you. If you would come unto me, I will come unto you. Where is this idea that people say, well, if only God would reveal himself, God will reveal himself. You didn't try. You lied. And you're still lying to yourself. You're lying to me. You're lying to your friends. You're lying to your neighbor. You're lying to your wife. You're lying to your church. You're lying to your pastor. You're lying to everyone. If you say, God hasn't spoken to you. Oh, yes, he has. 
Oh, yes, he does, and oh, yes, he will. But you have to draw near to him. You have to listen to him. You have to receive correction. You have to walk with your God and talk with your God because to do anything less isn't to be a Christian. It's to be a heathen. And so I present to you this day before the Lord your God, before the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, that you choose you this day whom you'll serve because you are serving already the gods of men. There's no doubt in my mind that I can see any Christian out there and I can tell every single one of them in some minor way for some of you that have gotten rid of most of your idols and most of your hunk of junk that's you know carrying around in your trunk, but every single Christian in some way is serving some idol. Now they may not be serving them as gods yet, but it's an idol. You know, you idolize something. Your Harley, that's an idol. There's no doubt about it. There's no reason to own a Harley. None whatsoever. Don't give me the excuses. You know better. A Harley is a Harley is a Harley, and it's made as an idol to be worshipped. Period. It's the brand. It's the name. It's the label. That's why you bought it. It's an idol. Now, do you worship it? Good question. If you got rid of it, maybe you didn't. But if you own one, maybe you do. That's all I can tell you is you still got idols. One of the things we had to do in the early movement, or Jesus movement, was that most Christians gave this testimony that as soon as they got saved, they had to destroy all their albums, their secular albums, their non-Christian albums, music that was written by non-Christians that just, it was too soulful. It was too much pulling on their emotions. They had worshipped those gods, and it is true. It is worship of gods, false gods, because it idolizes everything else except God. Whether it be love or romance or, you know, the dog, the cat, the, you know, the dog, the cat, country western, the dog, the cat, the wife, the ex, the whatever, drink, drugs, rock and roll, you name it. But the point is, we knew that in the early days of Jesus movement, Jesus movement, we did that. Now people are going back to it and saying, it's not so bad. I got grace. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. I can get away with it. Really. Good luck. You want to get cleaned up in the Great Tribulation period? Be my guest. Is that a criteria? No, but drawing near to God is. So anything that hinders you from drawing near to God is that with which it has become unto you an idol. And if it's become an idol, it's a stumbling block. If it's a stumbling block, then you're tripped up. And if you're tripped up, then you're not walking with God. You're stumbling after God. Because God doesn't want you stumbling and fumbling and grumbling along the way because he said, I'll cast you out if you are. Because I don't deal with that with my people. I'm not going to deal with that with you. I want you to walk with me. I want you to talk with me. I want you to hear me. I want you to receive from me correction. And I want to present you faultless before my Father with exceeding joy. For you are my bride, and you're precious in my sight, and I love you, saith the Lord Jesus, as he wants the Spirit of God to clean you up. Because you messed up, you know, and you, you blown up, and you full of pride and ego, and you got all kinds of things in your life. God doesn't want that. God doesn't care about that. The temporal things that you think are important in this life have no purpose and design in the kingdom of heaven. For God is not going to take anything with you except for you. That's it. When you walk into heaven, if there's anything waiting for you there, it's because you send it ahead. Not money, not gold, not silver, not precious ointments, not those things that you think of as far as being physicality, but rather the reality of what you did with Jesus, what you did with him, for him, by him, to him, and by his leading and guiding you in the days of your life. So if you've drawn near unto God and received correction and you hear his voice, then you are blessed. But if not, and you can listen to those and read those yourself in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3, or verse 2, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 2, there we go, let's reverse that. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 2, if you can look at that criteria and apply it to yourself, then you know what you need to do. Reverse the order, and that's what you need to do. Start with draw near unto God. Start there. Go reverse order on it. Start with draw near to God, then trust in the Lord, then receive correction, and then you'll hear the voice of God speaking to you. Because to put it bluntly, you've got all these other things in your way. You need to start today and pray. Seek the Lord, as we said in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3, if I'm right, yes. And then now we have in chapter 3, verse 2, draw near to God. So seek Him, draw near to Him, and then go through that list that we just mentioned of, to receive correction, and then to 
trust or to trust in the Lord, then receive correction, and then you will hear the voice of the Lord. And that's what we've been trying to talk about in Zephaniah all along. If you're not hearing God speak, it's your fault, not His. Repent. Turn again unto the Lord and get personal and get real and lay and put aside all the things that are hindering you from walking and talking and living with God today. For today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart as it says in the provocation because not just you might not have tomorrow, but God might be judging you according to this that's written in Zephaniah. He may be judging you as being in the Isle of the Heathen. He may be judging you today, and then you're going to have to deal with His judgment tomorrow, rather than receive His mercy and grace. God bless you. May God keep you until the time you can receive that with which God wants all for you. But in the meantime, I pray that you will acknowledge the Lord today and receive from Him even the rod of correction. The ability to give to God and say, God, I, I can't do it. I don't hear the voice. I get confused at church. I get abused by people. I get confused and abused by even Vidivo Church and Vidivo Bible and they're telling me these things and God, I don't know what to do. But God, I know one thing. You. 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 And all I know is you and so you do what you got to do and I'll take it. There you go. There's your prayer. You. As I often say, you. Just you, Lord. Nothing else. Don't give me any more words, Lord. Don't give me any more teaching. Don't give me any more preaching. Don't give me any more studies. Don't give me any more church. Don't give me any more feel-good worship. Don't give me anything, God. Just give me you. 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 Nobody else but you. Boop, boop, be doo boop. No, but you. You get it? I hope so. Because if you don't, if you don't get it, you're gonna. One way or the other. And I'd rather you get it from God right now than get it later when God says, I don't care that you now feel sorry for it. You didn't do what I said, so now I'll pour out my wrath. And yes, there will be Christians in the Great Tribulation. There will be Christians and the church in Great Tribulation. Can I say this one more time? Yes, there will be Christians in the Great Tribulation, as God said in the book of Revelation, and He's going to pour out His wrath upon the world, and there will be people down there. Yes, and it might be you. And I don't want it to. But she that we're speaking of is the bride. So you really do need to do what He told you to do, and draw near unto God.